Hello and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Laura Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Today is November 22nd, 2022, and it is my pleasure to have with me renowned analyst, thinker, journalist, and author Sarah Posner. Sarah is a, an expert on American pro-Israel evangelicals. Her most recent book is Unholy, Why White Evangelicals Worship at the Altar of Donald Trump, which was published in May 2020. You should all read it. Her investigative reporting and analysis on the religious right in Republican politics has appeared in Rolling Stone, The New Republic, Vice, Huff Post, The Nation, Mother Jones, The New York Times, Washington Post, American Prospect, Talking Phones Memo, and many, many other publications. And her 2008 book, God's Prophets, Faith, Fraud, and the Republican Crusade for Values Voters explore the unholy alliance between the Republican Party and prosperity televangelists. Um, You can follow Sarah on Twitter, assuming Twitter continues to exist, at Sarah Posner, all one word. And you can follow her on Mastodon, which seems to be where many of us are also going. And she is there at at Sarah Posner at Mastodon.social. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Laura. It's great to see you. Yeah, and and for our audience, I should say this is the I think the second time I've had Sarah on the podcast. She's also appeared on a couple of FMEP webinars. I'll put links to those in the notes with this uh, with this podcast. Um, I come to Sarah every time I want to learn and dig more into what's happening, as we said on the, on the the issue of Christian pro Israel evangelicals, and um, and I wanted to talk to you right now, Sarah, because I feel like there there's a lot of things happening. Um, and, and we can talk here about the context of the Israeli elections and the, the resurgence of, of Netanyahu and his relationship with evangelicals, uh, the results of the recent midterms, um, what lessons um, pro-Israeli evangelicals are taking from those midterms, and the race which started basically the day after those midterms <laughs> for the 2024 White House. So if that's okay, it's a lot to cover. Uh, we'll kind of jump around. So where I want to start off actually is with the Israeli elections and Bibi. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I know you and I both saw a tweet from a guy named uh, Dr. Robert Jeffress earlier this month that he was interviewing Bibi for his, his audience, his flock. I, I want you to talk a little bit about what Bibi means for American evangelicals, what that connection is like, why really even before the before Netanyahu has even formed his government, he's being interviewed by evangelical leaders and, and his word being spread uh, here in the States. Well, Bibi is a hero to many right-wing, quote unquote, pro-Israel American evangelicals, uh, people that we might otherwise call Christian Zionists. Um, and he is so because Uh, Not only because he has been a hero to the settler movement in Israel, but also in doing so, he has embraced the support of Christian Zionists from the United States. So they see him not just as a political ally um, with regard to the occupation, but they also see him as a quasi-religious ally because of his embrace of their quote unquote support. Um, And in Jeffress's case, I mean, Jeffress is an extremely prominent leader um, in evangelicalism. He pastors a historic Southern Baptist megachurch in Texas, um, which is kind of ground zero in a lot of ways um, for uh, politicized evangelicalism. And he's extremely close to Donald Trump. Um, He was one of the first evangelicals to endorse Trump in 2015, 2016, uh, and he remained close to Trump throughout his presidency um, and defended him throughout. Uh, I've interviewed him a number of times. He once told me that he went to the Trump house once every six weeks or so. Um, And he's also a very uh, strong Christian Zionist. He takes pretty regular trips, you know, leading trips of uh, American Christians to the Holy Land. Uh, And so, you know, the fact that he wants to um, showcase Bibi to his flock before Bibi even takes office this time around is just another indicator of how tight this relationship is. Thanks. And and I want to actually dive a little deeper into that, the, the Trump 
BB piece of it, and and sort of where that's where that fits into the the framing we're we're seeing more and more today from evangelicals. And it's it's not just obviously Trump and BB, but you know Trump is continuing today with his his statements that seem to suggest that not only that Jewish Americans should have dual loyalties, but that we're insufficient <laughs> in our dual loyalties, that we, we are insufficiently supportive of Israel because we should be, because we're Jewish, um, which seems to actually dovetail with the Netanyahu and, and approach and, and the approach of the Israeli right, which, which is largely contemptuous, if not openly dismissive of, of Jewish Americans. And, and I think it's worth mentioning here the the series of tweets that were that appeared yesterday from Netanyahu's son, Yair, on Twitter, if folks haven't seen him, it's a series of four tweets in response to Kanye West's uh, return to the platform when he said Shalom. Um, and, and, and Yair Netanyahu responded essentially by, by validating Kanye West's correctness in hating Jews who are uh, globalists. He, Yair used the word globalists and, uh, and who are not patriots and who are not conservative, but making the case that there are the good Jews, that, that he sh they shouldn't be calling out all Jews because some Jews like him and his father and the people that agree with them are good. Can you talk about that growing framing that we're seeing, I think, on the American right, which distinguishes between good Jews who agree with to right, agree and support a right-wing agenda on Israel and beyond, and then bad Jews who increasingly it's suggested um, are not really Jewish or aren't as Jewish as evangelicals who are more pro-Israel. Right. Well, I think I just want to say up front what one of the very alarming aspects of this and of, of Yair Netanyahu's uh, tweets yesterday um, is his use of anti-Semitic terminology in the course of uh, criticizing insufficiently loyal to Israel American Jews. You know, the use of the term globalist is definitely a hat tip to the, um, you know, the international far right, which uses globalist as a kind of dog whistle against, you know, Jews and, you know, supposedly communist, Marxist, whatever left, you know, evil left wingers. Um, and in this way, um, you know, you see, you've seen this before from the Netanyahu's, you know, when Netanyahu was in power previously, you know, he supported uh, autocratic leaders like Viktor Orban, who, you know, rose to power using uh, anti-Semitic tropes. Um, so, you know, this is part of a, part of a, a terrible trend in my view. Um, and I think that, I mean, I've been covering Christian Zionism for about 15 years. And I really feel like um, on the American right, this attempt to uh, compare and contrast uh, American uh, Jews negatively to Christian Zionist evangelicals has become far more overt and accepted. And I think I, I think that Trump has a big role to play there because um, you know he just comes right out and says it and then it somehow makes it okay for other people to say it. So he had that truth social post uh, about three weeks ago um, where he said that it was something like American Jews really need to get their act together before it's too late, which is infused with this uh, not just this sort of authoritarian scolding, but you know you have to understand that part of the Christian Zionists, a central part of the Christian Zionist theology about the role of Jews in the end times is that it's their duty as Christians to try to convert the Jews so that they don't, before it's too late, so that they don't perish in a lake of brimstone um, at the battle of Armageddon. Uh, and so, this used to be, you know, I would say 10 or 15 years ago, this used to be kind of a little bit of a third rail and American evangelicals were super careful about it because they didn't want to be seen as anti-Semitic. They had to work really hard to not be seen as anti-Semitic. I mean, you'll recall back in 2008, John McCain distanced himself from the founder of Christians United for Israel, John Hagee, after uh, you know these sermons surfaced where he suggested that perhaps you know God sent Hitler to punish the Jews for being you know insufficiently Jewish in his view, um, and that those days are gone in the Republican Party. I mean, now we've gone from in in the course of fourteen years, fifteen years, we've gone from the the presumptive uh, GOP presidential nominee distancing himself from John Hagee to the presumptive nominee 
overtly telling American Jews that they're not as good as evangelicals. Yeah, I I, I want to. I mean, I I agree. It is it is alarming. Um, a, a piece of that, and I, I don't know if maybe this is a good moment just to just dig into the word a little bit. A piece of that is 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 this this concept of philo-Semitism, which I'll admit I hadn't paid a lot of attention to before the Trump era. I mean, I knew that there were Christians who were deeply, deeply committed to some Jews because it fit into their, their religious and worldview um, and, and maybe didn't like other Jews. But this idea that there is, that the opposite of anti-Semitism or the antidote to anti-Semitism is philo-Semitism, which was a core tenant of the Trump government. We heard this from Ilan Carr, who was the special envoy for anti-Semitism at the time, right? There, this framing that, that philo-Semitism um, was, was the opposite of anti-Semitism. And we heard this on the campaign trail in the midterms when we had the candidate from Pennsylvania, Mastriano, his wife, when, when he was asked about anti-Semitism in the Republican Party, and she took the microphone and basically said that we love Israel more than the Jews. Right. Can, can, you, can you talk about this this whole theme? Of what is what is philo-Semitism? Because to me, it always seems that philo-Semitism is just another form of anti-Semitism. It's fetishizing the Jew, the good Jews that you agree with, and then hating even more actual right. you know, Jews in general. So, you know, this has long been a, a, a debate among people who follow Christian Zionism and, and, and Messianic Judaism, right? Uh, Messianic Judaism being, you know, kind of like Jews for Jesus, but it's not exclusively Jews for Jesus. There are other organizations and leaders who also espouse this. Um, and like I said, it's be, it's come way more to the surface uh, in, in the past four or five years than it had been before. Um, you saw it most explicitly with Mastriano. And, you know, people might think it's not worth talking about since he lost his race so badly, but it's very much worth talking about because it wasn't really something that was called out by explicitly by the Republican Party. Um, you know, he was their nominee and, and they maybe didn't, you know, support him with money, um, but they didn't not support him. They didn't, yeah, they didn't denounce him. You know, uh, Mastriano opened his campaign with um, shofar blowing, you know, right from the get go. And then many of his his campaign stops involved Christians blowing a shofar or Christians wearing talit or, you know, other uh, other expressions like of philo Semitism that were Christians, but were embracing these uh Jewish rituals and Jewish ritual objects, and therefore we cannot hate the Jews. And it's such a fraught claim to make that, you know, that I, if I if I have a Christian blow a shofar at a campaign event that proves that I love the Jews, I mean, it's really, um, you know, I think that that his campaign really sort of laid bare how hypocritical and wrong that is, and that it's, you know, actually, you know, anti-Semitic to use these ritual objects in the service of your Christian nationalist campaign, right? And he had, you know, what came out over the course of his campaign was his, him paying a uh, consulting fee to Andrew Torba, the CEO of the, you know, anti-Semitic, racist, hate social media um, platform Gab, you know, which inspired the Tree of Life shooter, right? Um, and so it was really astonishing to me that say the Republican Jewish coalition called on Mastrano to, to um, sever his ties with Torba. I mean, Torba is an outright anti-Semite. He says things like, I don't talk to Jewish journalists. Jews will have to bend the knee. We we're going to be a Christian nation and et cetera. Um, you know, he's a real extremist on this. And so, you know, Mastriano did cut ties with Torba and, and I guess, uh, shut down or 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 suspend his gab account but he continued campaigning on this christian nationalist slash philo uh semitic um you know style of campaigning and then when his wife said that um you know basically saying you know because we love israel and loving israel means you know let's translate what that term means when they say that they mean we support the occupation we support um, evicting Palestinians from their homes. 
we support settler violence, right? Because there's no denunciation of that. We support IDF violence against Palestinians. I mean, that's what they're saying when they say we love Israel. Um, and so the notion that American Jews who oppose the occupation and oppression of Palestinians are somehow less Jewish, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it, we don't talk about it enough, but it's a it's a it's a startling and you know slanderous claim. Yeah, I I agree. I think that's that's that. I think we don't talk about it enough. <laughs> I think the people who claim to speak for, I mean, my this is not a, a Jewish organization or organization that focuses on Jewish issues. I think the organizations that do focus on those issues certainly don't talk about it enough. Yes. Um, so a related issue, and as and you, as you point out, I think so importantly, when 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 people in this the evangel the pro Israel evangelical community say we stand with Israel, we support Israel, the, the what they mean, or at least a corollary argument thing they're saying is we don't we don't support Palestinians, we 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 are against people fighting for Palestinian rights, all of the, all of, all the stuff that goes with that for Palestinians. I want to ask you to talk about. Um, um, sort of the specific um, embodiment of that in the U.S., the flip side of that, which is the the recent announcement by the the next um, House leader, Mr. McCarthy, that he is going to throw Ilhan Omar off um, the House Foreign Affairs Committee for alleged anti-Semitism. And, and I will say first, I've seen people tweeting about this and saying, look, the Republicans, blah, blah, blah. I'll say, first of all, Democrats own this as much as Republicans because Democrats in the House joined in in attacking Omar for her comments about Israel, which I'm sorry, we're not anti-Semitic, can have that fight forever. Um, they're, 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 they piled on in a way which which made it very easy for, 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 for McCarthy today to be taking this step. But I wanna talk to you about what sort of resonance that that particular step has for the evangelical community. This is the leader targeting, she's a woman, she's Muslim, she's black, she wears a hijab. Um, I mean, the other piece of this final assembly. And she's an immigrant. And she's an immigrant. So it seems to bring in all of a, a lot of other pieces of the evangelical, the hardline evangelical political agenda all together, wrapped in the language of we're doing this because we support Israel. Can you talk about that? Well, I mean, Christian Zionism, right wing Christian Zionism in the United States is suffused with Islamophobia. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no other way of, of, of saying that. And, um, you know, evangelical, white evangelicals in the United States are probably the most um, susceptible or, or supportive of uh, Islamophobic tropes. You know, there's polling data plays, you know, uh, supports this. Um, you know, why, you know, they're more likely to watch Fox News. So they're <laughs> more likely to like, you know, see and absorb uh, anti uh, anti uh, Islamophobic tropes, but, um, and probably anti-Semitic tropes too. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, so that's, uh, that's part of it, that it's just easy for him to target the hijab wearing Muslim member of Congress. But also, you know, he is, reinforcing to them, to the evangelical base, that anti-Semitism anti only looks like one thing, and that is saying something critical of Israel. So to them, that is the definition of anti-Semitism. And so it gives them cover because it doesn't define what they're doing as anti-Semitism, right? So to say that it's your duty to convert Jews to Christianity so that they don't, you know, die when there's this apoc apocalyptic battle on Mount Megiddo is not anti-Semitic. Um, but Elon Omar criticizing the government of Israel, and also by extension, obviously, like any American Jew who criticizes the government of Israel, um, that's the de definition of anti-Semitism. So it's the McCarthy's uh, promise to kick Omar off that committee is, is, is doing a lot of work here. It's doing a lot of work for him politically um, and it's doing a lot of work for uh, Christian Zionism in, in general. 
Thanks. I, I think this is, I, I think anyone who's, who's surprised that it's happening today probably wasn't paying attention. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. It's doing a lot of work. I, I, I feel like this is something we're going to see more and more in this new Congress. I think it's, it's going to be pretty ugly. And I, as I've said before, in other contexts, I think that Democrats have set themselves up for this because they have not, they, they have chosen to not create space in their caucus for criticism of Israel beyond a certain point. And if you won't create that space and you call it anti-Semitism, you can't then um, get mad when the other side basically starts attacking Democrats for having an anti-Semitism problem because you defined it as such. So you own that. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so I want to turn a little bit now to the presidential side of things. And we've already talked about Trump. And we can talk about Trump more. Um, so Nikki Haley, who I think some are suggesting will certainly be president someday, if not in 2024, then sometime after that. I know that was someone declared that after the Republican Jewish Committee, Jewish, the RJC, Republican Jewish coalition. um, yeah, coalition. coalitions event in Las Vegas last week. Mm -hmm. um, so she tweeted out, she spoke at Cornerstone Church under Christians United for Israel's banner um, last week, I guess. And she tweeted this out. My faith has taught me a lot of things, to love the most vulnerable and to speak for the voiceless. That's great. To hate injustice and to hold wrongdoers accountable. Awesome. But one of the biggest lessons I've learned as a Christian is this, we have a duty to stand with Israel. So again, I don't know that much about Cornerstone Church. I know Kufi, can you, can you talk about what a statement like that means to that audience when she is essentially running for president making this speech? Right. Well, if you're going to go to Cornerstone, um, which is a megachurch in San Antonio, Texas, which was founded by John Hagee, who is also the founder of Christians United for Israel, you you basically if you're if you're a Republican and you go and you speak there, <clears throat> you basically have to say that you have to make that statement about Israel. Otherwise, what was the point of you going? Right. That's the entire point of going and speaking to Hagee's audience. Um, and uh, and I, I'm not sure, actually, you know, I know he's very elderly now and his son has been doing a lot um, of the preaching in the church. I'm not sure who was there that night, whether it was both of them or not. But in any case, um, that, that's pretty much what you have to do as a Republican if you go there. I mean, that's what that church is known for. Um, it's what Hagee is known for. He's considered um, a top, if not the top leader, a top leader of Christian Zionism in the United States. and so there would be no point <laughs> for a, a, a Republican presidential aspirant to go to that church and not make that statement about Israel, to uh, equate support for Israel, which again, let's emphasize is support for the right-wing government of Israel and not any, you know, they would they would probably quote unquote, maybe support another, um, a, another government, but the reality is that they're, they're politically aligned with uh, Netanyahu and saying that they're supporting Israel really means that. So I will say what struck me in that quote was the juxtaposition of saying that you've learned to love the most vulnerable and speak for the voiceless. And we, that means we must stand with Israel. We hate injustice and hold wrongdoers account, accountable. And then juxtaposing that with standing with Israel. It's really, I think, a fascinating framing for arguing that no matter what Israel does, Israel is the most vulnerable. It is the voiceless. It is the one facing injustice. It is the one who is being wronged and wrongdoers to Israel must be held accountable. It was It was just a, fa she, she speaks beautifully. And I think she speaks with, with great, with a lot of intention. I take her at her word that she has, there's intentionality in the yeah. framing. Um, and I found that really um, pretty striking. Well, given... I think it's important to remember that in within Christian Zionism, the notion that um, Jews are persecuted or oppressed plays into their theology and the reason why they have to quote unquote love Israel. Um, and so they would, you know, use the Holocaust and the and the and the need for the founding of Israel, right? Um, in 1948, both as uh, a fulfillment of God's will on the one hand, um, but also something that had to be done because the Jews had been victimized. And so both of those things are kind of happening at once, that on the one hand, you know, Jews need our protection. And I think that a lot of, and also, you know, therefore, 
will support whatever the right wing Israeli government does because that's so, protecting Jews from other enemies. You know, we protected them from Nazis. We protect now we protect them from Palestinians, right? I mean, it's a lot all of that is kind of conflated in their minds that there's this historic um persecution of the Jews. And as Christians, they both have to protect them from that persecution by supporting Israel and also by aiming to convert them to Christianity. Right. Now that, that makes complete sense. Um, so moving on to another uh, presidential uh, potential candidate, or maybe the more than potential. Um, so Mr. DeSantis from Florida was at the Republican Jewish Coalition event in Las Vegas as well. And, and there's a lot of headlines out of it. The, one, the thing he said that's getting the biggest headlines certainly um, in, in the Israeli press is the line about Judea and Samaria not being occupied, but disputed. Can you talk a little bit about DeSantis, particularly in the context of Christian Zionism and the, the role that he plays? And I think it's worth noting that, that when we talk about you know, the role that this issue plays in, in the policies and politics of the US, we also can look at things like laws where, where people like DeSantis and Nikki Haley have played a leading role in, in passing laws in US states that, that take, you know, boycotts of Israel or settlements and make them, you know, punishable if you're trying to get state contracts and banning, you know, the, banning investment. I mean, we actually have concrete, um, concrete, uh, embodiments of these views in law increasingly, um, including one which is potentially going to go to the Supreme Court, where what is at stake in this boycott law that's going to, if the Supreme Court agrees to take the case, what's at stake isn't just simply whether it's okay to boycott Israel or settlements, it's whether or not boycotts overall, the, the, the act of boycotting is protected by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. And if this court finds that it is not, that has implications for boycotts of everything, which maybe is consistent with other other planks in the hardline evangelicals worldviews. Can you talk about some of that? So first of all, DeSantis um, referring to the occupied territories as Judea and Samaria and that they are disputed and not occupied um, is a fairly common talking point among Republicans and Christian Zionists. So that was you know, even though it's still shocking that someone who might be president does not accept that the um, annexation and occupation is illegal under international law, <laughs> um, like we should continue to be alarmed and startled by that. However, the use of that language is pretty, uh, pretty commonplace. Like that's a that's a pretty standard thing. And it's it's a dig and it's a very DeSantis, DeSantisian get dig. Um, at liberals, because he's going to equate calling it an occupation with the woke mob, right? That's kind of where he is. Um, I think with regard to his presidential run, DeSantis um, knows he needs to win over Trump's white evangelical base. I mean, nobody is going to beat Trump in the GOP primary without doing that. Um, and it's not going to be enough for Mike Pompeo and Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, hypothetically, to split the evangelical vote with Trump in a GOP primary, because probably what would happen is what happened in 2016, that Trump would win it. Um, so because he's still, you know, he is not, nobody's going to beat Trump at the I'm the most pro-Israel president ever, because he moved the embassy. That was a huge thing for, I cannot overstate what a huge thing that was for American evangelicals. The moving of the embassy is right up there with, you know, it's like second. So like the, if you ask an evangelical, what did Trump do that was so great? He appointed the anti-Roe Supreme Court justices. Um, he tore up the Iran nuclear deal and he moved the embassy. Maybe not even in that order. The, the Supreme Court's always first, but like, you know, those are the other two things that come two and three. Um, and so DeSantis probably knows that he's competing with this hero. Like, you know, if if you're talking to a voter for an evangelical voter for whom, you know, this these Israel issues are super important, it's really hard to compete with the president who who moved the embassy. So, you know, this is what he's up against, and this is this is who he's speaking to. But I think with DeSantis, there's an additional related thing going on, which is of course, he is the uh Republican governor of the most, you know, the the 
biggest Jewish population in the United States, uh, you know, in his state, you know, New York, Florida, um, but he's, you know, the Republican. So, you know, he can boast to audiences, to Republican audiences that, you know, Jewish voters in, in Florida love him, right? He won, he's won twice. Uh, and um, so he can also, you kind of use that as his calling card to deflect the, you know, maybe maybe the Republican party has a anti-Semitism problem. So I think there's like a couple of things going on there with him, but I think one of them is that he, like the other uh, GOP hopefuls, knows that um, on this issue, Trump is the top dog. Thanks. So you actually anticipated my next question was to talk a little bit about Trump. And I don't know if, you, if there's anything else you want to say. I mean, it he's clearly running again. Um, I mean, I got to say one thing that I think is still baffling for a lot of folks watching this who are not Trump supporters is how evangelicals can line up so firmly behind Trump when in theory, aside from the Israel part, he he is he, in, his, in who he is as a person, he doesn't seem to, to embody the the, the the values of, of, of the Christian values, I would say, is capital C. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, is that how do, how do you see him? And I guess simply, how do you see him leaning on his credentials as um, in the eyes of evangelicals, the most pro-Israel president? Um, and also, how do you see him playing into the relationship with Bibi? Um, and, and maybe, you know, I can combine my last question with this. My other question is Bibi. So Bibi is back. Bibi is very, very comfortable with evangelicals. Bibi is very comfortable with the US political system. And my guess is in the next two years, Bibi is more than happy to create lots of reasons for friction with the Biden government and doesn't really care about that because the bottom line is he sees that, I'm guessing, as good for Republicans and good for him in ensuring the Republican is the next president. Do you wanna also first talk a little bit about how this plays for Trump and then speculate if you are willing to on, on how Bibi looks at this coming period and what role he plays in US politics. So uh, with regard to evangelicals and Trump, the, uh, the their view of him is that sometimes God sends an unlikely leader to lead a country at a critical moment in its history. So the fact that Trump's been divorced, Stormy Daniels, you know, his whole affect, everything, is of no consequence because they've been convinced that he was chosen by God, unlikely, but still it's God's will um, because America is at this critical juncture in its history, you know, under threat from the woke mob or LGBTQ rights or abortion or what have you, right? And Trump was willing to do all these things, you know, nominate the Supreme Court justices, move the, uh, move the American embassy to from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, you know, talk about religious freedom for Christians, all of it, you know, meet with evangelicals on a very regular basis, welcome the, him, them into his, uh, into the Oval Office, all the rest of it. Um, and, you know, he's seen by a lot of evangelicals as being like King Cyrus in the Bible, um, who, you know, brought the Jews back from the Babylonian exile. And again, this is um, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, biblical analogy thinking, um, that ties in with their views of Israel and its, you know, role in some, you know, God ordained plan, um, much like King Cyrus, uh, you know, enabled the Jews to restore the temple in Jerusalem. Trump is enabling uh, Christians to restore Christian government to the new Jerusalem, America. Okay, so there's a lot happening in that. But uh, you can't just look at it as like, oh, well, why, you know, they talked for so long about family values and he is not the family values guy. So how can they support him? It's, it's, it's pointless to think about it that way because it's really more about what I just described. Um, and with regard to Bibi, I think he realized that he's no, you know, he's not politically stupid, right? And he knows that you know, maybe Trump getting the nomination is likely, but not inevitable. And so he probably realizes that he needs to, you know, make nice with all of the possible candidates, but he probably, you know, I'm sure he already has a good relationship with Mike Pompeo, um, uh, Mike Pence. We, we haven't even talked about him, but, um, you know, it's easy to forget him at this point. Um, and, um, you know, all of these sort of high powered Republicans, he's probably very familiar with. So I would expect BB 
uh, to you know keep all of his options open because he wants to have a good relationship with whoever uh, the nominee turns out to be. But he also probably doesn't want to anger Trump. None of them want to anger Trump because, of course, we all know what comes when you anger Trump. So I think that'll be really interesting to watch how BB navigates the field of Republican candidates, knowing that, um, you know, knowing that he's going to have to, ha you know, need a good relationship with whoever comes out the victor. Yeah, I, I agree. That's going to be fascinating to watch. I, I I fear that along the way, it's going to be a lot of open contempt for um, for people who are not supporters of the Republican Party, including Jewish Americans, that's the majority of Jewish Americans. And then in parallel, I, I really worry, particularly when you talk about um, the, it's not just the Republican Party, but the, the contempt, the, the, the view that everything Israel does is, must be defended and what that means for Palestinians on the ground, as we face a new Israeli government, which has in it's as of today, it appears in two of the key posts. Um, I mean, the, the previous moderate government was terrible for Palestinians in on both sides of the green line. It's hard to believe that a government of extremists, of overt extremists, unapologetic racists, um, Islamophobes, anti-Palestinian bigots, um, and people who have a history of of, of calling well. I would say people who have history of run-ins with the law on their own side because their views, it's hard to believe that's not going to be much, much worse on the ground. Um, and in the two years of an election cycle, um, that, that bodes ill for U.S. engagements um, now and in the future. So on that incredibly gloomy note, um, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I have like a thousand more questions, but we're going to cut it off here, try to keep this short enough for people to process while they're driving in their car or something. Um, hope to have you back again soon if you will allow us. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much uh, for our audience. Anytime. Thank you. And for our audience, thanks for listening or for watching. And as I said, don't forget to follow Sarah, Sarah Posner um, on Twitter and on Mastodon, uh, Sarah Posner at mastodon.social. And finally, as always, I want to remind you, subscribe to the Occupied Thoughts podcast. You can do so on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify. That way you don't miss any of the great content we're posting every week. And you can also find this podcast and a video of the podcast and my notes that will go with this podcast at our website at www.fmep.org. And with that, we're going to end it here. I'm Laura Friedman, president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Thank you, Sarah Posner, signing off until the next episode of Occupied Thoughts.